Hi, everyone. It's Margaret Josephs. Thank you so much for joining me in our live book signing. Uh, my book is out, Caviar Dreams, Tuna Fish Budget. And I'm so excited to be here with my dear friend, Danny Pellegrino. And he's Hello. like, moder yes, thanks, Danny. He's going to be moderating this. You can get a signed copy. The link is below. I'll be doing some live signings and we'll be doing some about the book. There's so much you don't know about me, you know, about 25% of my life from the show. And Danny, we're going to fill in the rest of the blanks. I know. Margaret, I have so many questions for you. First of all, I just want to know how you're feeling. The book came out yesterday. Are you feeling proud, nervous, excited? What are you feeling? I feel proud, nervous, and excited. All of those emotions. Because now my whole life and all my vulnerabilities and all my good, bad, and ugly is out there in print for life. And you were telling me before that you actually got to go to the bookstore and see it on the shelf, which I, I must imagine is an exciting moment. Yeah. It, you know, it made it so much more real because obviously I read the book over and over. I knew it was coming out, but to actually walk into a bookstore and see it on the shelf with all these other, with all these amazing authors who've written books before, it just, it was a surreal feeling. And then to see someone come in and buy it and see me there and they're like, oh my God, could you sign my book? Felt great. They probably freaked out that you were right there in front of oh, them. Oh yeah, it was so funny. It was so cute. She's like, Marge, what are you doing here? It was so cute. Okay, I got to ask a shady question. Have you heard from the other cast members of your show about the release? Yes, yes. All, I have all of heard. them? Not all of them. Not all of okay, them. Who, who didn't reach out yet? Uh, I didn't hear from Teresa and Jennifer yet. But okay. I didn't, they, don't, they didn't get their copies yet. They're just getting their copies. I'm delivering it with a beautiful package because we're going to reunion. So I wanted them to get it right before reunion. You're going to reunion soon? Are uh, you ready? Tomorrow. It's tomorrow. So tonight, Danny, I'll be checking into the hotel. Oh my God. I'm so excited to hear about it. Now, uh, Margaret, I, I thought this book was great. There's been a lot of Housewives books, but I think more than any of the other Housewives or a lot of the other Housewives, you're someone who we've seen on the show for so many years, but we didn't know a lot of your story. Uh, what made you want to open up? Were you nervous because a lot of people who are fans of the show didn't know as much about you? Does that make sense? It, yeah, it makes sense. You know what it is? I got on the show when I was 49 years old. People knew small tidbits of my life. They knew I was married before. They knew two of my stepchildren were, were estranged and upset with me. Uh, there was so much more to my life that they didn't know. And I was like, you know what? I've lived five lives before I've got on this show. I grew up with Marge Sr. in the 70s. She's 20 years, only 20 years older than me. A uh, single mom no, was not common. There, there's that whole story. I was married to Jan for 20 years, by the way. Uh, and he's 20 years older than me, same age as Marge Sr. I not only raised my three stepchildren that we had full custody of, but we have a son together that I never mention and never talk about, which I, I talk about in the book, though I did change all the names <laughs> because I wanted to keep their privacy. I talk about that. I talk about starting my business. I, there's just so much more. I mean, there was a lot in there. And I wonder for you, what was the hardest to open up about? Um, what were you most nervous about opening up about? I think the most nervous opening up about was talking about my marriage and my family, because that's still very emotional for me. And I, I had to do it with kid gloves because it, it is private. They, they all, all my children remain private. And it, it's still, it's still hurtful because there were so many beautiful times and painful times. And to reveal that part of yourself it is very hard and to be vulnerable like that. How has everyone in your life responded to it? I mean, aside from the cast members, people like Marge Sr., how did they take the book? Well, Marge Sr., there was a lot of, you know, interesting topics about Marge Sr. in the book. I and, love Marga. I'm interrupting you for a second. I loved okay. all the Marge Sr. stuff. I thought it was so good and juicy. And we've seen her on the show, so I feel like we have a connection to Marge Sr. And so learning about your upbringing to me was, was the best part of the book. I loved it. Oh, thank you. Yes, and Marge Sr., our relationship has come so full circle because really I'm like her BFF and I was always her little sidekick. So she felt good about the book. I think people were nervous. They're like, oh my God, you said that about your mother? And we were, and I was like, yeah, Marge Sr. knows. We lived it. We lived it together. So she loved the book. She laughed at a lot of the stories about her. Just, I mean, the, the woman let me drink coffee at the age of four and I was eating Oreo cookies. And there's a famous story about it in the book that's very funny. 
that I had shared. So she really enjoyed the book. I, I think it made her cry. There were some stories later in my life that I had never told her till she read the book. And she was like, why didn't you tell me? And I was like, I don't know. I just didn't feel like telling anybody. I felt shame about it or whatever it was. But she absolutely loved it. I mean, something she didn't remember. She's like, oh, I went skinny dipping with my entire party. I'm like, yes, mom, you did. <laughs> oh my God. I saw in an interview, you mentioned uh, it, cinematically the story of you and Marge Sr. I, I think you had said you'd love to see like Kate Hudson and Goldie Hawn take it over. And I would love to see a scripted version of this, uh, of the story between you and Marge Sr. So is, is that something that's in your mind? I mean, I know you 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 mentioned Goldie and Kate, but, but is that something you're thinking of seriously going forward? I would love to do something about it going forward because I think it's such a great story. And in my book, it's a few chapters, but it, it could be much longer. Marge Sr. is a Hungarian immigrant that went over the border into Austria on a bicycle with her parents and only arrived in the United States with just the clothes on her back. It was given a doll by Eisenhower, who was the president on Christmas Eve. And her story really is just such an amazing story of, you know, leaving everything behind, coming here, the American dream, cleaning houses as a little girl with her mother, and just really, you know, being a single woman in the 70s and and raising a door. Yeah, I think it's just such a great story. It's almost as someone described it as a crazy Gilmore girls, you know? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, that it was cinematic to me. I was reading oh, about it. I'm like, you. this is just, it, it would make a great TV show or movie or something like that. Oh, thank you. I would love uh, that. Talk to me about the business stuff that you opened up about in the book. I would, just, you know, about my, there's two parts of my business life. There was the sexual harassment part in the first part of my career, um, which was important for me to discuss because in the late eighties, it was very common that women were sexually harassed, young women in the garment center, especially. And I opened up about it on my show as well. I spoke about it in the book and I think people poo poo it, or I was told I was slept my way to the top or, or did something like that. And that's, and that's not the way it was. And you felt shame and you couldn't speak up about it. And you would, and if I left my job per se, then it was happening at the next company. There was Russian hooker nights in the company I work with on, on Thursday night. That that was common. So it was just, but it was an industry I loved. It was the fashion industry. I wanted to be there. And it was just something women accepted. And you felt for some reason, you know, women are made to feel, and men as well, I'm not saying it hasn't happened to men uh, numerous times, that you brought it upon yourself. And I, it's very timely that Finally, years later, many years later, women have spoken up in Hollywood. Powerful women have, have faced the same thing. And we, we can finally say something and people and can speak up for themselves. And it's not that I wanted to get anybody in trouble. I just wanted to say, hey, this was going on. It's a conversation. It's happened to everybody. But let's not be a victim of our circumstance. We could still push forward. We have a voice. This is what's happened. But let's make a change. And I think it helps readers and people who watch your show feel less alone if they've gone through a similar experience. Exactly. I mean, all of the stuff in your book, I think uh, helps in that way. What's it like watching this season of uh, Real Houses of Jersey? Because you did open up just a little bit. You go into more detail in the book about that. Um, but what's it been like seeing uh, some of the other cast reactions to that story uh, in confessionals and in the scenes? Well, some people had reactions that were so supportive and understanding, like Melissa, like Dolores, like Jackie. Teresa, you know, in the moment really had a, a when I told her the first time, had a nice reaction and she was very supportive. And she was one of the ones who told me that, you know, she had some issues that um, uncomfortable circumstances at one point. But I was surprised that Jennifer, having young daughters, couldn't relate. And, and it really was, I was shocked that she took a vulnerable moment and threw it back at me, but we work it out like people see later. And I think once she hears the way I say it in the book, she understands. Um, you know, it's always upsetting when people don't understand and take a vulnerable moment and throw it back at you. I really said it to show people it's just, it can happen to anybody. Right. It, that right. really can happen to anybody, any, any type of person. You and Jennifer, are you good now? I mean, I think 
we're all friends in general on this show. Uh, and there's times that everybody gets on each other's nerves. Right. I think talk we're very to, different people. <laughs> talk to me about joining the show the first time you were reached out uh, to join the Real Hospitals of New Jersey. I just want to be taken back to that. Yes, the first time I was asked to join the show was in 2013, but Joe and I, believe it or not, I had an agent and we had filmed a whole pilot called Pigtails and Power Tools and we were slated to do our own show. But prior to that, I had done a tape for Housewives and they had called me and Lucilla D'Agostino, she'll tell you, who was uh, who had owned Sirens at the time, called me up and said, Bravo wants you to be the housewife. Um, we'd love to come over, talk about I said, I can't do it. I'm doing my own show. Pigtails and power tools. Sorry, can't do it. They actually even called the production company to try and get me out of my deal. And, and they said, no, and I was, it didn't even phase me. It just wasn't the right time. So when they came back to me, it just, it just worked out. Did you know any of the women back in 2013 during that initial period? No, I don't. I really, I didn't know any of those women then. Yeah. I just feel like this, and when it, they came back to me, it was perfect timing, actually. I just feel like my business was doing great in 2013. By the time they had come back to me, I had I just gotten a horrible lawsuit. It, it was it was terrible. My business had taken a terrible hit. And I said to Joe, you know what? It, it's great timing. The kids are out of the house. Everybody's either moved out in college. Everybody's all over the country. We had just moved into this house. Shockingly, we you know we weren't living here forever. We bought it as a project. I literally was here a few weeks. The show came to us. It took us two weeks to work it out. And I was the new housewife. You know, one of the things that I find refreshing about you on the show is that in this housewives world, uh, on Beverly Hills, for instance, there are sometimes these lawsuits that uh, the cast members don't want to talk about or address. And then we cut to you on Jersey, who you're just like, oh, yeah, this is a lawsuit I have going on. And <laughs> I um, I wonder what it's like. Do you watch those other franchises? I mean, there's some legal stuff going on with uh, someone in Salt Lake City and some of the other franchises. Like, what do you think in terms of the connection between being on reality TV and and having this legal stuff going on? Does yeah. that make sense? Yes, I, it totally makes sense. I think when I I think with me, it's like I've had a business for many years, 21 years. Uh, that wasn't my first lawsuit. Uh, the business that I'm in, it's not uncommon to have a lawsuit because I'm involved with so many partners in licensing, which you'll learn about a lot in the book. I explain it in total detail, licensing and how it works. And I was like, what's there to be ashamed of? It's it's totally business. It's common business practice. One company sues another company. You get caught in the middle of it. Was it annoying? Yes, that everybody was weighing in on it, didn't understand it. But I was like, yeah, I'm going through it. It, you know, they froze my bank account. They did this, but, 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 but I was used to it, right? So it did, I didn't, you know, to me, it wasn't like a big deal. It was a big deal that it cost me a lot of money, but it wasn't, it wasn't something I'm ashamed of or embarrassed of. I was like, when you have a business and you're, you really are a legitimate business, it's something you're used to. So I was like, all right, it's my real life. Not a big deal with these other housewives who want to hide it. I think they feel embarrassed or ashamed or maybe something unethical is going on. I don't know <laughs> for sure, but I, I, they just, I don't understand it. I don't understand. They, you could just address it and put it to bed. It's easier just to address it and put it to bed. You know, I'm just so fascinated by the Jen Shah of it all, which I know we're here to talk about your book, but I'm just like, I can't wait to see it all play out. Oh, I mean, that, that's a whole other thing because I feel like everybody else's lawsuits on housewives have related to their spouses, their husbands, if you really think of it. Mm. Teresa, Dorit, um, right. Erica right. Jane. That's all with their spouses. That's not directly them. Jen Shah is directly her. I didn't even think about it like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Margaret, tell me about the Joan Rivers story. Can you give a little taste of the Joan Rivers story? Yes, Joan Rivers uh, is was the most iconic woman. And, you know, she didn't really get famous till later in her career. And that's, I always say, you know, she schlepped along. People said no to her a lot of times. And my agent, Amy Rosenblum at the time, was very good friends with her. And she threw Amy a party. So Joe and I were so excited to go there. And I, and I showed up wearing my pigtails, 
I remember a green dress, my boobs out. And at the time I was doing a lot of lifestyle expert stuff on all TV shows, um, Good Day New York, CBS, NBC, my home network, just saying, would not put me on. I was not on the Today Show as of yet. And they said, you know, she's not middle America. She wears pigtails. She's a little out there. And Amy goes, take your pigtails. I was like, I don't want it. I'm like, I, I don't want it. I don't want to take them out. So I went to Joan Rivers' house and I guess she had relayed the story to Joan and Joan had pulled me aside and said, you know, Margaret, you're different than these other blondes. You're, you're different and stick to your guns. You're very authentic, be yourself and don't listen to anybody else. She goes, every, you know, a lot of people said no to me. She goes, it's just the one person that says yes. And don't ever change because because you're different. It's better to stand out. And I took that to heart because coming from Joan Rivers, that means a lot. Right. Yeah, and she's amazing. She was amazing, right? She was unbelievable. Everything. Yeah. Class act, everything, adorable. We loved her. Joe and I did were you, like dying over her apartment. Did you ever see and that her. documentary she did? Uh, a piece of me, I think it was called or something. It was on Netflix. It was amazing. Yes. If anyone hasn't seen it yet, it's everything. Yes, it is everything. It was, yeah. it was so fabulous. So I felt like that's such, and I think that's just such a good advice for everybody. Uh, Margaret, I imagine you get a lot of messages uh, from things you open up about on the show, uh, whether it be on Instagram, Twitter, social media. Uh, has there been something that's really hit home for you uh, when it comes to your story? Like what have you, what's the feedback you've heard from people? I think people um, don't understand the complexity of the way Joe and I got together. And people are very, I say in the book, are very quick to judge um, an infidelity in a marriage. I swear they look at it worse than like drunk driving or going to jail mm. or any, any, any tragedy, selling drugs, anything like that. It's a very, people take that very personally to themselves. And I, I was a little shocked by that. I don't know why I was so shocked by that. So, so many people write to me about it. I have people who write to me who are like, I'm in an unhappy marriage. I don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. I get people who ask me for advice. I get people who are like, you repulsed me. <laughs> you know, I can't believe you did that. So I wrote a lot about that in the book. And, you know, there is collateral damage when something like that happens. No one plans on doing that. It's not a planned out thing. Things happen in life. People change. Um, no one wants to hurt somebody, but no one leaves a happy marriage. It, it wasn't like I was tripping, you know, my husband. And it was, as I write in the book, it was a slow burn. It was, it wasn't with a light heart that I was like, all right, I'm packing my bags. I'm it was nothing remotely like that. And I think that was like hard to talk about. And I think people will see a, you know, a different side of it. And I think Jan truthfully, and I love him so much, we're great co-parents, but I think he's a lot happier without me <laughs> as his wife. You mentioned something, uh, you know, some people reach out and they say awful things to you. Did, when you joined the housewives, did you have a thick skin for that? Or at the beginning, was it a hard adjustment in terms of like the social media aspect of it? I think I've always had a very thick skin um, from a young age. I don't know why I think grow not that a lot of, I didn't even know my mother and I were so different, even though there was a stigma being the daughter of a divorced mother. I mean, some little kids weren't allowed to sleep in my house because I didn't have a dad at home. So I, 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 I learned early on not to let certain things affect me and what other people thought. My mother was basically like, uh, it's none of our business. What other people think of us. She was very much like that. And so I feel I have a thick skin and I always find it entertaining. And I like, I make a little banter. I'm never vicious to the people who attack me. Usually I always try and make a joke out of it. I, I deal with a lot of negativity with humor. Right. My mom always said to kill people with kindness because it drives them wild. Like, yes, it does. So I do. I do a lot of that too. I'm, I'm like your mom. I, I do a lot of that. It just, I mean, listen, people, people used to tell me your mouth moves so funny. Joe goes, oh yeah, I always knew that. Your mouth does move funny. It's fine, you know, it, yeah. So who cares? I mean, no one's perfect. It, it does move in mysterious ways. Uh, we've seen on the show, you're always with an iced coffee. I don't know. Have you seen some of the memes and, and people kind oh of isolating all of your iced coffee love? Yes, I just didn't realize that was going to catch on so much. Very big iced coffee drinker. 
drink a lot of my drinks in a fancy glass because I don't drink alcohol. So I always love that people who drink alcohol are drinking in a beautiful wine glass or something else. So I was like, oh, I, I'm always drinking my drinks in a fancy glass. So I always drink my iced coffee in a big red wine glass. So when the show picked up, I had no idea that day. It didn't even click to me until I saw the episode. Everyone's like, oh, I'm drinking my iced coffee that way. I thought that was adorable that they picked up on that. We love it. Talk about your uh, decision not to drink. I know you you touch on it in the book, but can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, growing up with Marge Singer, who's, again, I said is only 20 years older than me. She was in her early 20s when I was a little girl. So it's really like someone who just graduated college. So she she was a party girl, definitely drank too much. And watching that, um, I learned to see that it's not pretty when it turns a corner. And I said to myself at a young age, I mean, literally a young age, <laughs> six, maybe I'm not doing that. I, it made me nervous. It made me anxious and uncomfortable. No one wants to see their mother throwing up. No one wants, to, no one wants to witness that. It's just, it's just not cute. Right. So I made a conscious effort that I wasn't going to drink. Even in high school, you could ask any of my high school friends. I never drank in high school. I was the designated driver. I just was very uh, clean about it. Then as I got older, I tried to have a few drinks and it brought horrible migraines on. And I was like, well, obviously this was meant to be for me never to drink because I get horrible headaches. And I, listen, Joe drinks, he loves a good gin and tonic. People around me drink. Melissa on the show, she's a cute, fun, tipsy drunk. She doesn't turn the corner. I think when it turns a corner is when I don't like it and I don't find it attractive on anybody, men or women. I mean, my husband threw up on the show. I had a fit. Right. <laughs> is it ever hard when the rest of the cast is maybe uh, parting around you to be sober or? No, no. You know why? Because yeah. I'm a good time girl. Let's see, I could, I could stay out all night. That's the whole thing. I'm the last one to leave a wedding. I'm the last one to leave a party. I'd love to dance all night. I'm not someone who goes to bed early. You could call me at one in the morning. I'm still up. So I, I'm still, I'm a lot of fun because I'm lucid. I'm in the moment. I want to have a good time. So I don't need a drink to, to do that. So I enjoy being around the others. And you guys aren't really like a New York cast, like the New York cast can, they can uh, throw down on a, on an episode. Yes. Uh, was there anything from the book that you left out that you're thinking, maybe this will go in the next book or, or um, you know, what, what more do you have to reveal? What more do I have to reveal? I think the next book would be a book of mother-daughter relationships. Because I do write a lot about Marge Singer. But it's also about mother-daughter relationships are the most beautiful, but also the most complex. Right. Because, you know, women, the way they relate to each other and mother and daughters. And it's so interesting. And I think people have a lot of issues with their mothers. Daughters. Oh yeah. The, my girlfriends, like right. the girls that I know in my life, they have the, it, it's so bizarre to me, the relationship that my closest girlfriends have with their mothers. It's like hating each other one minute and loving each other the next. And yes. it's hard for me to understand a little bit, <laughs> yes. but I noticed that. Yeah. Sons and mothers are different. Like my son is like, I'm like obsessed with him. I would never, you know, it's, it's a different relationship. So my mother and I, I think we've just come so full circle and the, and the road to healing and the way we've navigated it and how people, I think we could be really helpful to each other, do it with a sense of humor and help other mothers and daughters. It's really a beautiful story, um, a coming of age story together and just how she's changed and everything else. That kind of book I would love to do. That, that would be a great book to do. Um, I think that, I feel That'd like that, great. I think people would want to know more about that. And also my mother, listen, she's a very modern woman. She's 74. She goes to work every day. She dumped me. She was working in the city. She left that job. COVID hit. I mean, she only comes to me one day a week now. And now she's working for someone else, a wine distributor. She does she's all their, busy. yeah, she's busy. She's there every day. She does all their books. March Singer trips the life. Fantastic. Nothing. And I, th you know, I think it's important because she, she still has goals at age 74. Right. I want to ask you, what other goals do you have? I mean, this book must have been a huge achievement for you. It's so great. But like, what else is on your dream bucket list? Oh my God. Okay. My dream bucket list is, <laughs> okay. I have a new, I have numerous dream bucket lists. Um, some of them materialistic and mo most of them business related because 
I do love having a business and I'm very entrepreneurial. Uh, Lexi and I, because I've been in licensing so long, I haven't owned anything myself in a while in business because licensing is you license out your brand, other people are making it, you get paid on royalty, which anybody could ask me about. It's all in the book, the way I explain. Um, Lexi and I are doing a mocktail together called Soiree. It's already trademark. It's underway. It's called uh, Soiree Your Way. Um, party like a rock star, wake up like a superstar. So, <laughs> oh, God bless me. you. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah. So I said, because so many people do drink or uh, and then decide not to drink one night or whatever it is, it's very inclusive, but it's about having a good time. But I'm sick of ordering iced tea every time I go out or cranberry juice and club soda. So I want something that could taste like a cocktail or that you could spike, but it's a mocktail. Oh, so we're, we're working on that. Um, so we're going to be launching some, you know, and that'll be in like little slim cans and very sexy and fun and great, but non-alcoholic. And then I would, I do a lot with the women's center and mentoring women who are getting back into the workforce, uh, in my town in Englewood. And these are women who've been abused, who live in shelters, who are single mothers, who have had circumstances happen to them that they never thought would happen that the rug has been pulled out from under them. So I work very closely with the Women's Center in Englewood and women come from all over Bergen County, New Jersey to go there, to get clothes, to learn how to get back in the workforce. I do a lot of work there, Lexi and I do, and so does my mother. And my mother teaches them computer classes and we, and we do a lot of stuff. So I'm really working on that as well and trying to get these women back on their feet. And that's super important to me because giving back when you, especially from where I come from, right? If, if no one gave my mother and my grandparents a leg up when they got here, where would they be? Right. Uh, Margaret, I got to ask you, everyone in here wants to get some Real Houses in New Jersey tea. Okay. So, okay. So let's start with this season. Uh, Melissa and Joe, a lot of fans of the show, myself included, feel like this is maybe a little fake thing. Danny, I, I, what, I, what I swear, it? I swear, swear, swear. Now I'm going to have to swear in my life. It is not fake. If you were with me in the van that night, I'm not, it is real. I think something happened and I think it could happen to all couples. There, there gets moments of insecurity. Men get older. Their wives are like superstars, right? They, they get a twinge of maybe she's slipping away, even if she's not. And some kind of insecurity comes out. And I think it, it was very scrutinized and it just happened to have all fallen out on the show. I, I mean, you, you haven't finished watching the season, but I, I've, I'm friendly enough with Joe and Melissa, like very good friends. And Joe works with Joe all the time. It wasn't fake. And I think she got accused for that because like, listen, they didn't find her sister that one season. She was really looking for a sister. The psychic did say that because we didn't find the sister. That, look, she didn't do the... I understand, like, because it didn't come to fruition. But this, a hundred percent, I believe me, I lived it. I was nervous. I was like, "What are you doing this for?" Ooh, it was, I was like, creeped. <laughs> "I'm not even kidding." You. I was like, "What about you know? the baby? What about the baby thing? That was fake, right?" No, <laughs> you know, she was feeling. No, she was feeling old. She was trying, thinking, "Holy shit, I'm turning 40. She, you know, in her head, was she probably gonna have a baby? But she wanted to think, like, could I still have a baby? Could I spew it out if I wanted to? You know look at her. She doesn't look 41 now, whatever it is. But Joe is, I'm going to say it, is a jealous guy. Joe Gorga, I love him. But Do you think that was always there and it just sort of erupted? Yeah, I think that's what it was. I think they had a hard season. I, I feel bad about it. Listen, I yelled at him. You're going to see further this season. I, I yell, I'm close enough to where I yelled at him. Then, I, then now I feel guilty about it. They were going through something. Uh, you know, that episode in the Jersey Shore was very explosive, that fight when uh, Joe and Teresa, what's it like sitting there in a moment like that when this brother, sister, sister-in-law thing is happening? Do you feel like you should get involved? Do you feel like you should step back? Like, what are you thinking in those moments? Because they're always such intense fights. I don't like to get in the middle when it's family members, like a brother and a sister. If it's like a Melissa and Teresa, their sister-in-laws, I, I, I weigh in and give my opinion. If it's a brother and a sister, I really don't like to get in the middle of it. Unless it got really ugly, then I'd get in the middle. Right. Do you think Teresa and Melissa even like each other? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe they I do. Think, you don't believe they do. Do I think, 
they like each other. I think that um, they're related. I think they love each other. Do I think they always like each other? No. Do I think they always like each other? No, I think there's, but I think that um, for the sake of the family, that they, they care about each other and they want the best. I do believe they want the best for each other. I think they've learned to coexist. So uh, what's to come this season? What else do we have to look forward to? I think you are guys going to get to see me shoot the book cover, which was so great. And that's, that was fun in my house. You're going to get to see a great renovation. Finally, you're going to get to see major renovation and a big reveal. So that's good news. Uh, You are going to get to see more Melissa and Joe. And I think you're going to realize that it is real and it's sad. Um, I think there's sad stuff with Jennifer and her family, her mom, which is a bummer for them. Um, And then what else do we get to see? Uh, Dolores and you know people get get on her about David you know just real everybody has real relationship stuff going on yeah uh what do what do you would you like to see from next season I know you, you don't necessarily have any control over casting or anything like that but in your heart of hearts dream of dreams like where would you like to see the show go in terms of casting I would love to have more strong women come on who um who have businesses who, you know, could teach us something, who bring a different dynamic to, to the cast. I would love to learn something from someone else, learn about a different culture, a different um, background, just some, some diversity or someone who's lived in another country for years, uh, any, anything, something different. Let's put it that way. Any kind of different w- woman who brings a different perspective to this group. You know, it's always fun on your show watching the husbands too. I I think that's something that sets Jersey apart is we get these scenes with the husbands that are always really, really fun. Um, Does Joe like filming that stuff? Like what's what's he think of all of this? Yeah, Joe is just easygoing, great guy. He's very, yeah, he likes it. He loves, he gets along great with the guys. He he works with them. Joe um, by trade is, it's funny master plumber which is funny to be a master plumber is like a big deal which people don't realize because not a lot of people could be that um so he he does all the uh plumbing for joe and frank uh does a lot of consultation so he always works he loves it he gets a big kick out of it and in, in real and the truth is he he's in he's a real estate investor so he just does that because he he's done that his whole life so everyone always yells at him Joe, why are you always home? He's like, I'm old. I don't like to work that much. (laughs) I get it. Yeah. Uh, uh, You know, I interviewed you after that premiere, which had that explosive Jackie Teresa moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, after you've seen it all unfold, do you feel differently uh, about it than you did uh, when you were living through it? Do I feel differently about it? Not really. I feel like it was, listen, I think Jackie wanted an apology. An apology just like that the person was like, had no basis saying it. I'm not, you know, she wasn't even saying Teresa made it up. She was just saying, it's like the person you heard it from didn't even know us. I, I think Teresa wasn't giving her what she needed. Um, she said in an analogy, it was, it was an analogy, just the way she even said, it was like, eh, you know, I wouldn't have used it. I don't like to talk about anybody's children. That's true. I don't use analogies like that, but it went down that way. Everybody pushed each other's buttons. I wish it could have been wrapped up a lot sooner, (laughs) you know? And then of course, you know, then it went down the pike of, you know, the guys talking about it. And then that was a whole other story. You know, in your book, you do these little life lessons and I marked one yes. and this one feels so apropos. Uh, you say a strong yeah. person knows when to end the battle in order to win the war. Yes. And I thought that was really interesting. And, and in some ways, I think that uh, applies to them in a weird, maybe cheesy kind of way where they- No, I think you're absolutely right. A strong paddle. Yeah. A strong person knows to end the battle when, and, you know, to win the war. And I think that was, I'm using that in the book, applicable to my lawsuits and uh, when I had went over to someone in a restaurant and I had to take things into my own hands and, and you know, you got to know when to fold them. And a strong person does know when to fold them. I think, you know, sticking your heels in is not always a sign of strength, speaking even of, on a TV show. Speaking of heels too, Margaret, there's this picture of Marge Sr. and you. 
Yes, um, I know. That's so funny. Marge Singer in a belly these shirt. Photos. I, I know. love these photos. Aren't they great? Aren't they great? So what do you want people to take away? I know we're here to talk about the book. What do you want people to take away from <laughs> it? What, what uh, lessons? The lessons I really want people to take away is to be inspired, to face their fears, to not be victims of their circumstance. Because I always say, and, I, and I've said this before, whatever happens to you in your childhood is not your responsibility, but it's your responsible as your adult to fix it. And I really believe that because to say that this happened to me, uh, that's why I'm not successful, or I was mean to you because I was abused as a child, it, does, it doesn't make a difference. We have to fix it as we get older. We have to move on from the past. We, we're not responsible for that, but we're responsible how it affects our future. So I just want people to see that. Like I've lived so many lives, you know, I'm not from the lucky sperm club crap happened to me, but I, I pick myself up by the bootstraps and we, and we all move forward and I could do it with a sense of humor. Life is painful, but don't let it hold you back. Don't let fear hold you back. Be, you know, I wanted to inspire people. I want people to, you know, realize everybody's the same. We're all the same. We all want the same thing. We all want to be loved. We all want to have our own version of success. We all want to wake up happy. And like, you could chase your dream. Everybody has big dreams. It's just, you know, going for it. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience in just a second, but really Great. quick, Lexi's in the book too. And yes. we've seen Lexi on the show a little bit. Was there ever any uh, plan for Lexi to be around um, even more than she is? Or yeah, is that something I feel that you're like, interested yeah. in? I love having Lexi around. I mean, she can never be a housewife because she's on my payroll. So I don't think they'd want a housewife that's paid by another housewife. <laughs> but having her around, she's so funny, so charming. Sometimes I think they cut out stuff, the stuff that she says. Um, she's great. But Lexi, um, she's such, you know, she's just my constant. She's here every day. We're together. When she's not here, we're on the phone. Joe's like, I mean, you guys are together constantly. I love seeing the pictures of you guys. Okay, so Bobby from Yuma, Arizona wants to know, was it hard to go back into the past or remember your vulnerable moments and was it freeing letting the past go? Yeah, Bobby, yes, it was very hard. It was like a lot of crying. I mean, when even when I was reading it back, I was, I was crying, it was painful, but it was very cathartic and very freeing. Absolutely. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, it must, it must have been great yeah, to it sort was of like, let it, was it go. Like a, it was like a therapy session. Uh, Leanne from Kittery, Maine says, I think you're amazing. Oh, thanks, Leanne. In your life and career, what has been your biggest challenge? In, um, in my life and career. Okay, in my life, uh, choosing to get divorced and leave my husband, that was very, very hard. That was my biggest challenge ever um, because I did have the most, I could start crying now, Leanne. I had the most beautiful, best family unit, but not the best marriage. And to choose a personal happiness because my kids were all out knowing that I wasn't making anybody else happy. You can't make anybody else happy unless you're happy. And I, I couldn't go on like that anymore. Now every, you know, now everybody's happy. So that was the most personal challenge in my career. Um, I had a business partner at one point and, you know, just facing the lawsuits and trying to fold, ugh, that was so terrible. Breaking up with one business partner was a very big challenge for me to, to grow a pair and just say, it's like, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. I didn't have my name on the business bank account. I had to stand up for myself. I was intimidated because I felt like they knew more than me. And when I realized they didn't know more than me, I, I, I had to break up with them. And that was also very hard because I felt like they had my best interest and they didn't. And always know that you have your own best interest. <laughs> This might sound like a Oprah moment or question, but when do you feel like you're at your peak version of you? At, at what point in my life or what point, or just at, in any time? Throughout the day in your throughout life, when day. do you feel like you're the best version of Margaret? Um, after a good night's sleep. <laughs> after, I feel like I'm the best version of me after a good night's sleep, a great meal. And, and when I'm calm and not like on my phone, not on social media, after I could just like really think after that's when I'm the best version of me. I happen to have a very ADD creative brain. I'm constantly, constantly thinking it's, it's not 
peaceful. I'm the best version of me, like after a vacation or just, I need a little peace and, and calm. Like after the weekend, I, I need a mental break. That's the best version of me when I could think of great ideas and I'm, I'm on my creative streak. That's when I feel like I'm the best version of me. I get that. Jennifer from Garfield, New Jersey asks, what advice would you give to someone opening an online store or boutique? Were you scared to start your own business? Um, Jennifer, what kind, well, depending on what kind of online boutique, I have different uh, ideas, but yes, I wasn't, I wasn't that scared to open my own business. I was just like, go for it. Maybe that was my problem. I always say I'm 50% delusional, 50% determined. Um, what's the worst that can happen? It could fail. And that's, it's not failing. It's just like, then you move on to something else. You could reinvent yourself a thousand times over. Um, I think now an online boutique is great because everybody's shopping online. So it makes absolute sense. My advice is social media. They didn't have social media when I first started my company. So it's such a good time to do it because everyone's shopping online. Take advantage of social media, Instagram, um, the best photography ever for whatever you're doing. And it's so easy to do it at home. You could do everything yourself. So I think it's such a good time to do it and reach out to influencers micro influencers, because they'll just do posts for you in general for not money, just trade and gift um, and things like that. The best way to get in touch with magazine editors and to try and get yourself pressed, because this is what we used to do. I used to look at every magazine and see who the editor was and reach out to them, send them an email, talk about it, try and get hype on yourself, get pressed. I did it all myself when I first started. I literally would buy every magazine and look up every editor's name and send them stuff and reach out to them. But I don't know if you're selling your own product or other products. So it depends what it is. Wow. Have you noticed a big shift in, in your business practices during this coronavirus oh, era? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, listen, I took a very bad hit at the beginning of Corona because we had tremendous orders going into retailers through licensing and everybody canceled orders because stores were closed. So all, all my revenue, I didn't get paid for months. So it was terrible. Everybody was conserving cash, but I was like, all right, what are you going to do? So people aren't buying jewelry right now, right? People aren't really going out. So jewelry sales weren't amazing. Now they're just starting to pick up again. Luggage, my luggage licensee went out of business. So I, people aren't traveling. So what are they buying? They're buying athleisure. Um, Thank God people are still buying beauty stuff. So that's great. I have an amazing line in Target, Candy Couture. They're doing my makeup brushes, things like that. Things that make you feel better. Self-care is doing great. So, you know, at this time, different things are selling better than others. Anything fitness, athletic stuff. Um, if Marge really doesn't work out that much. Now she's on her Peloton. So anybody who has a fitness line is doing great. So if you're selling fitness stuff, so cer certain things are selling better than others. So I definitely pivoted and did some things. My Peloton has just become a laundry rack at this point, but uh, <laughs> Stefan from Las Vegas, Nevada wants to know uh, what coping what coping techniques have helped you the most when having to deal with the estrangement of your children? And has that situation changed at all? Uh, Stefan says, I was a gay step parent and now can't have any contact with them uh, for the relationship ending. So I'm still struggling and would love even a little bit of advice. Oh, Stefan, I'm so sorry. I know it's so, so painful um, because I could still text, you know, my kids and the Lancer, you know, the Lancer, and I'm close with my ex-husband. It's maybe a little bit easier for me because I was with them for so long. But I would just say is just, if you could find anything about them, knowing that they're happy and doing well, should give you some sense of peace. Cause I always say that I, I know that my kids are doing okay. So I have some sense of peace um, and just know that you were so amazing to them. They're never going to forget you. They love you when they're older and, and can make their own decisions. Hopefully you guys could have a relationship and just, and just rest your laurels on that, knowing that you were the best parent ever, that you're an amazing human and know that they love you. Um, and that you guys will be back together one day and just don't give up hope. Joanne from California and Georgina from Windsor, Ontario ask, how long did it take you to write this book? Uh, what Ooh, process? A little emotional. Little Stefan, I'm thinking of you. Yeah. Um, we, we love, we're sending love, Stefan. Uh, how long did it take you to write this book? What process of creating the book did you enjoy the most? Was it shooting the cover, writing a specific chapter or something else? Okay. The process of writing the book is because 
it was during COVID, during filming. <laughs> and yeah, so that was crazy. I, the process doing it was just with my ghostwriter was the transcribing and that, that wasn't that fun because it's just like, you're reliving it, you're retelling it. Um, the most fun part, truthfully, was shooting the cover because that was just such a fun day. I was with Marge Senior. We had everyone in the house. My that looks great. Just, the vision I had with John Vero Jr., who was also who's the creative, uh, art director of um, Simon Schuster, he had the same vision I did: the high low, the French fry box, the tuna fish on a bagel with the jewelry. So that was we both are very. He's amazingly creative, and I think I have a creative brain. So we were on the same page. That was the most fun. And writing some of the chapters of my childhood was also great. But you know what? The whole process was great. Even the painful parts, I loved it. But the, the easiest fun part and not emotional was the cover shoot. I think what's really fun about it is it, that it, it feels like we're we're listening to you talk as you read it, if that makes sense, which yes. it, it, it makes us feel kind of connected to you in a way that we don't really get from the show. Yes. And the whole process was not as long as you would think, truthfully, because- we pounded the pavement. I think it was like four months, which wow. is not long. No, no. I mean, and publishing book, takes publishing write. takes like a really long time. So to kind of put it in that little period yeah, of time. Yeah, so to write the book took like four months. Right. So we finished it. I think we turned it all in in November or something like that. Uh, Gina from- Gina from Chapin, South Carolina wants to know, if you could go back in time, is there anything that you would do differently? Um, on the show or real life? Uh, either, <laughs> like either. Let's that, do both. That. Let's do both. Let's do both. Um, I think I would have maybe ended my marriage sooner. It got a little far off and, and just been a little more upfront about everything because it did, it did. I caused pain. If you, if you know, in hindsight, just so, just so I could fix some things. Um, it was just very hard. I think I, I would change that because it was, it was very suffering. I, if I could go back in time, um, on the show, the only thing I would change is some of my outfits because no one wears pigtails down to their vagina. And, and the first season I had those pigtail extensions in, and I never wore my pigtails that long in real life. And on the show, they're like, be over the top, be your over the top stuff. I was like, so Julius, my hairdresser is like, all right, we'll put in pigtail extensions. I was like, what are these things? Cause I never wore my hair like that. FYI. What's your favorite look from the show, from all of your seasons? Is there one that you're like, oh, I look good in that one? Um, well, I'm trying to think, which look did I love the best? I don't even know. I mean, I think I'm critical of my look all the time. I actually like myself without makeup on the show a lot, if that makes sense. Sometimes I feel like I look younger without makeup. I never like myself in a bathing suit, just saying. Those, those, are, those are days I do not like. There's a lot of love for Joe in the comments. Oh, Donna, Donna from Lawrence, South Carolina wants to know, has Joe finished the home remodel, which we've all been waiting for forever, yes, Margaret. I've been critical of this. What's going on? Danny Pellegrino, Jesus. You will be very happy. There's a big reveal at the end of the season for the main level, the main level, not even the second floor yet. But yes, Joe, um, you know, we had to abuse him during the pandemic, the poor guy. But it is a restoration, not a renovation, I would say. The house is was born, built in 1906. So when I got this house, it was a labor of love. That's what I always say. So I always love a project. I came in here, I love interior design. I love architecture. I'm very into historical homes. It would have been much less expensive to build a new house, truthfully. Joe's like, I don't even know why I let you rope me into this nonsense. So, so you will see a big reveal, a big renovation. The whole kitchen is done over, the ballroom's done over, everything. You're going to be very happy. I can't wait. We've been waiting. I'm excited yes, to see that. Yes, you're going to be very excited. Uh, Cassandra from Henderson, Nevada says, love you, Marge. What has been the funniest or most memorable moment while filming Real Housewives of New Jersey? The most memorable or funniest moment. Oh, God. I have so many memorable, funny moments of filming. Let me think. Let me think. Um your funny. husband's in the pool is your really husband's iconic. in the pool. I mean, yes. But your husband's in the pool. Very memorable. Um, I want everyone to know, I don't remember saying that line that night when I was like, your husband's in the pool. Cause Andy Cohen called me and he goes, Marge, I can't, that line. Oh, kills me. When you said that, said, oh, when you're walking out, I was like, what are you talking about? Oh, okay. Andy. Blah, blah, blah. And I like laughed at it until I saw it. 
was like, oh, that's what they're talking about. It was just so off the cuff. So that's very funny. What was very funny to me, which I mean, did it make such a big scene is when we did the horses in the water, Jennifer, myself and Jackie, she literally got shit in her mouth. She <laughs> fell in the water. I was cracking up. It was very funny for me. Like you guys, that kind of stuff is funny. Like when, when that crazy shenanigans goes on and people don't realize it. But yeah, definitely your husband's in the pool was great. Even when I threw the red wine at Danielle, even though it was mean, you, you, Danielle was like downstairs screaming at me. And she's like, my dress was more money than yours. Your dress, you know, scream. that kind of stuff is funny to me. You know, have you seen, yeah. have you seen Danielle on social media is like saying she wants to come to the reunion and ask stuff. Are you following oh, any someone of Someone sent it to me. I mean, that would be, that would be iconic. <laughs> that would be funny. I uh, mean, let, she's, she's got to give it up, this poor thing. Uh, Michelle from Moss Beach, California asks, how is Marge Sr. and has your relationship changed over the years? Yeah, Marge Sr. is great. Our relationship has definitely only gotten better. I mean, listen, I'm very hardcore, I feel like, to the fact is I, I learned to set boundaries after you know, cause I would get affected by things when I had my son. And I, I think I might've said it. I think I said, look, I told, yes, I did. I told Marge Singer, you will not drink around my son. There will be no drinking. There will be, I, I can't have stuff like that. I can't have bad behaviors. I, I have certain boundaries that I have to respect. Marge Singer, our relationship definitely has changed because we're so close. We have we can tell each other anything, but we have great boundaries with each other. She knows like there's certain things don't do to me, you know? And there's certain things I can't do to her. And I think that's a healthy relationship and we've learned to have a healthy relationship. Who does Marge Sr. like most on the show in terms of the other cast members? She likes Dolores and Melissa. Interesting. She likes Dolores and Melissa the best. Uh, Francesca from Clinton, Connecticut wants to know what is the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I've ever received. Um, Mm. you know, there's, there's a few things just basically I, I was told by Joan and I've been told by other people. Um, oh, you know, who told me always, just always be humble. Don't ever forget where you came from. And so I mean, that is just like, you have to remain humble and true to and, and authentic. And it doesn't matter if you're dealing with the, the person who, um, does the laundry or takes that or the, the president of the United States treat everybody the same. And I think that, and, and that's the way I live my life. I don't care who it is. I treat everybody the same. You know, Margaret, I think I've told people this before, but when I was at BravoCon, I was really sick that weekend and you were so nice. I, I think I probably told you this too, but I remember throughout the weekend, I kept running into you and you kept checking in on me and saying like, did you get cough drops or, and <laughs> yeah. it was so, it was truly more than anyone else I had met there or seen there. You were so lovely and kind oh, away you. from it all. And I just, I, I remember appreciating that so much. Oh, thank and, you. And thinking, I, I hope, I wish everyone could know like how nice she was to me. That, that oh, you're so can... sweet. Thank you. Okay. No, I'm very, you know, I'm more maternal, I think, than people people know because people are always like, oh, she doesn't have her own son. She doesn't have this, she doesn't have that. I'm like, I raised children most of my life and and I still have children in my life. And I think people don't realize that. But also, by the way, not to throw shade at other housewives, but normally I've talked into a lot of housewives before and normally they don't really ask, you know, something about you. And so, it, you know, you definitely have a, a different vibe that I think, uh, you know, I hope people will get from reading this oh, book, just how, how kind and empathetic you are as, as a person. So. Oh, thank you, Danny. I um, re related though, Angela from Georgetown, Illinois wants to know, what advice would you give to a 40 something struggling in her career? Angela, you're struggling. Are you struggling in career? Like you don't know what you want to do? Could she, could she latch right in and just say, I don't know if it's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to change careers? Are you struggling in the same career? Because listen, 40 something, you could totally change it. You could reinvent yourself. You can, um, because I look at it this way, Marge Senior lost her one job when she was in her 40s. And she totally reinvented herself. I think now is the time, especially that we're in a pandemic, are coming out of the pandemic, people are really reassessing what they want to do. So we're not too old. FYI, I got a TV show when I was 49 years old. Whatever it is, 
reach out to anybody you know. Um, if you have to take a course online, all courses are online. So it's so easy. You could do it from your house. Um, now is the time to whatever career you wanted to do. I don't care how minute or how big it is, do something you love because now is your opportunity to do it. And listen, if you, if you don't have your job, everybody, could, not that I want to encourage unemployment, but I'm just saying there's opportunities now um, where you can go back to school. There's assistances, you know, if it's a financial thing, there's so many things that can, that can help you financially till you could get on your feet. I don't know if it's like mentally in your career or if you're not working or whatever it is. Now is there's many opportunities to change your career. If there's any time, now is the time to do it because we are home. I know we're going to wrap this up. Christy from uh, New York wants to know what's your favorite of Melissa's fake storylines and what? No, I'm kidding. That's not really it. <laughs> oh, you guys are vicious against. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I'm just listen, being shady. I know. I feel. I feel bad because you know Jennifer put that out there last year, gave her the fake story, the fake story. Now I'm going to have to throw a little shade myself. Who has, you know, when we're talking about other housewives, now I'm going to have to do, what do we know about Jennifer? I know about her mother. I know about her brother. I know about the other brother who got married. What do you know about her? Well, there you have it. There you have it. I'm just saying that. So it's just like, we got to give it, you know. Melissa's feel, gorgeous. We love, Melissa's one of the most I mean, come on, the humans. girl doesn't have an ounce of cellulite. I mean, seriously. I stunning. It's terrible. She's I'm stunning. So, but some of those storylines. Oh, I'm right, just kidding. Right, I'm being this, shady. No, but Danny, this year, this year, I swear, I would tell, I would say like, ah, but if you come for dinner with us, when I go to LA or you come to New York, I'm going to take you to dinner. You come to dinner with us. I'm telling you, you'd be married to like a short Italian guy with the, you know, who's like, he, he gets upset. He got, he got upset. Believe I me, do sort upset. of under, I, I actually do sort of understand. I mean, I'm Italian and my, I have two, you know, I, I grew up in a big Italian family. And so I, I'm being shady, but I do, you know, I, I definitely it think it really was, it somewhere. was, it was like, I actually was nervous. I was like, are we doing this on camera? I'm like, relax. You know, I was just like, Okay, the last official question, and then we're going to tell everyone to go buy the book. There's a link that people can just buy a signed copy. They can literally get a signed copy of you from the link. Yes, um, but get Chris, a signed copy. Get one. I, it's like not that much money, and it's a great book. Right like, go I buy it. Signing, I was signing live. Live your dream. XO in the launch. I know. You've entertained us for years. Uh, support <laughs> by buying the book. Um, Christine from New Jersey, though, this is the last question. What was your favorite memory or story from the book while writing it? The favorite memory or stories from the book while writing it is really with my friend Stubbs growing up. I have so many stories with her because they're with Marge Singer and Stubbs and we had went to Europe together. <laughs> and there's there were just some there was just so many crazy stories about me growing up with her. And she was always my she was my sidekick. And we're still very close to this day. I changed her name. Her real nickname was Stubbs. Her real life name I changed in the book because she was like, oh my God, people are gonna find out all the crazy things we did. I mean, 16, we were going to the limelight in the city, sneaking into nightclubs and I was stealing my mother's car. We even got in a car accident. I lied to my mother and said, you know, a tree fell on the, the windshield in the middle of the night when Stubbs's head went through the windshield. I mean, we did so many, so rewriting those stories and I could have written endless ones were very funny to me and I enjoyed them so much. Margaret, this was so fun. I love seeing you. I loved reading the book. Is there an, is there an audio book? Is that an option? Uh, yes, there's an audio okay. book also, which is in my voice because I did the whole thing myself and there's some cute little surprises in there and it's great. So if you want to hear from the horse's mouth, get the audio. But if you want a signed copy, get it now in the link below. And thank you. Know, you know, I love having a signed copy of the book on the bookshelf. I mean, there's nothing better than having a signed copy. So everyone, if you watch this live, go buy it. It's not that much money. Go buy the book, support it. Yes, support support the march. She's giving you great advice. There's life lessons in every chapter. We love you all. Thank Margaret, you. congratulations. Thank you, Danny. I can't wait to be together. Thank you so much. I know. I'm, ta I'm taking you up on that offer to go to, oh, uh, to sure. figure out if this is lies or truths. <laughs> And then you can report back on the podcast. I will. I okay, will. perfect. Thank are you. We, are we still on here? Should I hit the leave? Bye, guys. Thank you Bye so guys. much. Bye, guys. Thank you.